Well, hello, that's me again, and <clears throat> don't pay attention to my voice and my appearance because I caught some bug, which is absolutely normal, common cold, and I'm feeling better already, but yesterday it was miserable, obviously. It's all the result of the <clears throat> constant running in the airports and moving on myself the huge number uh, number of items of luggage if you wish so uh, so here i am speaking with a little bit of the uh you know convoluted voice if you wish so but let's get uh to our goal so to speak and i will uh, go immediately and tell you that uh obviously the major news are this news i didn't translate them on the uh <clears throat> through the browser because it, it, it gets you ridiculous translation from Russian to English and it's just not readable anyway but it's very simple what it says it says that the uh, missile complex Sarmat is now on the combat duty in the first line and so it's ready to go if God forbids need will arise so and <clears throat> As you might expect, and it was spoke many times, some people say that its uh, its range is up to 18,000 kilometers, others say that it's much longer than that, but the uh, truth is that thing can fly uh, from the, uh, under the South Pole and attack from basically unexpected uh, uh, um, directions and has an enormous uh, energy, and it has a very short active uh, uh, um, active uh, <coughs> cut, so to speak, active trajectory where it accelerates so it's very difficult to intercept by any, any means. So it's basically unintersceptable and it can carry up to 10 uh, um, avant-garde uh, hypersonic gliding vehicles which have the uh, speed and access of 20, Mach 27. So it's now officially on combat duty and yeah, these are bad news for those people who want to really I am, conceive something really, really dangerous as as we go uh, <clears throat> and I caught it through uh, Paul Joseph Watson but <clears throat> Tucker literally uh, stirred the pot uh, two days ago and he, when he predicted that in order for Uniparty to stay in power and especially when you look and consider the fanatical and illiterate uh, neocons both in uh, Biden administration, the State Department, and Pentagon, they will be able to or will try to basically unleash their uh, war, hot war with Russia. <clears throat> if you go to my um, Block I already elaborated uh, on that. It doesn't mean that they may not try. Those people are illiterate. They are in panic mode. And uh, who knows? I mean, you can expect anything from those people. But uh, the, the, the issue here is that the United States doesn't have the resources to fight such a war. And especially it cannot uh, get the resources to uh, actually European theater of operations because uh, for starters, I mean, any kind of the uh, transport or shipping lanes of communications will be controlled by a Russian Navy, especially submarine forces. And when you have the uh, ranges such as Kinjal of 3,000 kilometers, which is hypersonic, I don't think so you want to even try. But you know what? Who knows? So, and here we go to now we suddenly have this really... I don't even know how to explain it. There's something like, uh, if you go to uh, Larry's, my friend Larry Johnson's uh, <clears throat> blog, he wrote about it uh, quite extensively about what is going on with uh, American generals who parade themselves as amateurs. And I begin to think that they are amateurs, obviously, but there are a bunch of other uh, American officers who would, uh, you would suspect have better understanding of warfare than uh, those uh, clowns which are, you know, originate from the neocon orgs such as the Institute for the Study of War, such as Mr. Petraeus or whatever the other uh, generals. But point is that there is something wrong with people. They uh, kind of, it got to them, the special military operation, and even uh, Colonel McGregor, whom I respect profoundly, he is a true professional, but again, he doesn't know much about Russian military history, but even he starts to say that, you know what, uh, uh, Russians do not accelerate because they are afraid of NATO, uh, you know, interference, and they don't want to fight NATO. Um, 
No, I don't think so. It's the case at all, and uh, the only reason Russia's uh, uh, Russians are standing, so to speak, while simultaneously moving towards Kupiansk, which are there on outskirts of Kupiansk, is very simple. There is a strategic reality which Kremlin and obviously Russian general staff have to consider, and this reality is uh, <clears throat> very simple: how much of Ukraine you want to put on the balance of Russia. Period. That's the only reason why Russians are kind of not procrastinating. And again, there are many people say, oh, I don't understand how this war is prosecuted. Well, you're not supposed to know how this war is prosecuted because obviously nobody shares the operational and strategic plans of general staff with us. Neither do I. I don't have access to the, you know, main operational directorate of the general staff. I don't know Lieutenant General Rutskoy, who is the chief of this uh, thing. Obviously, I don't know Mr. Mr. Putin, personally, or Mr. Medvedev. So, the strategic decisions and the uh, data set uh, and uh, actually information and intel they operate is beyond our grasp. And so, just guys, you know what? Uh, of course, anybody who asks those questions constantly in my uh, <clears throat> Uh, discussion boards, hey, you are free to go to some, you know, shysters like, you know, there are many military bloggers who never served a day in the armed forces or who just completely made up their, uh, uh, basically, biographies. You can go there and they will show you all those explosions, lancets, fly flying into this, and they will be talking about all those, you know, strategies and things like that. Well, obviously, they don't know what strategy is. Neither, most of them, I would say 99.9%, .9%, they have no clue what operations are, but I don't know. I can only speculate, and that's what I present here as my, so to speak, speculation. Granted that I try to speculate uh, on the, how to put it politely, you know, on some professional foundation, some professional basis. And I, based on my professional experience, based on my education, based on my social circle, which in what has many people uh, in my social circle, people with the senior officers, uh, including from some very serious organizations, we don't know. Nobody's going to tell us. And rightly so, because nobody goes out there and presents their plans and say, we're going to do this and that. And that's what many people do not understand. But I can tell you, obviously, very clearly that, for example, my, profoundly respected by me, Mr. Uh, Douglas McGregor, he is uh, plain, you know, simple wrong. Russia is not afraid of the uh, confrontation with NATO, and again, this is the part, there are contingency plans for that, that is why you have more than 300,000 uh, uh, active army being in reserve. It's the fact that how much do you need of this Ukraine? Even considering the fact that Russia already incorporated basically four new subjects into, which is five and a half million people additionally, it's 120,000 uh, <clears throat> square kilometers of the territory, by the way, so much for Russians, you know, losing the war. So now, how much do you want to accept more? Kharkov? Possible. Odessa? most likely down the road, but that's about it. You do not want those people on your balance. And I wrote about it in my blog three days ago. Read about it as my friends who went through and are there, they said there are no friends for us Russians in there in Kiev or anywhere, there are some, maybe people, you know, maybe some very small percentage of the so-called Ukrainians who are expecting that Russians will come in, uh, uh, you know, basically liberate them and then kind of give them all money and, you know, all this uh, uh, support and welfare that they can continue to do what they were doing. That means running the country into the ground. That's not going to happen. Russians do not want that. Overwhelming majority of Russian population do not want that. And anybody who talks about now about the brotherly nation and brotherly people, forget it. This uh, feeling is not there anymore in Russia. Russians know who Ukrainians are. They are no friends and they are, now, are no brotherly nation. <clears throat> so, and that's what brings us to other thing. While McGregor makes this uh, interesting kind of observation, which is wrong, I totally uh, ready to discuss this, but we have Mr. Wilkerson, Chief of Staff of uh, Mr. 
uh, late Colin Powell and uh, Colin, uh, you know, uh, Colonel Wilkerson uh, started to talk through uh, dialogue works, a great uh, uh, actually resource, and he talks to <clears throat> about restructuring of the Russian army. I was able to sustain or, you know, tolerate about 10 minutes of his explanations. After that, I scratched my head and I said that, yeah, the guy has no clue what he is talking about. And when he is talking about the, uh, especially che First Chechen War, which happened to be uh, 28 years ago, I don't know, does he know anything about modern Russia? No, he does not. And he is uh, basically... <clears throat> Military views are those of the people who still believe that America is the great fighting force in history, as Mr. Obama said. But it's not. American military record is dismal. It's not nowhere near of Russia. But hey, here he is, and he begins to speculate on something. He doesn't speak Russian. He doesn't have connections. He doesn't have social circle in Russia, and especially professional social circle. Yet he goes out and talks about restructuring of the Russian army while having no access, not even a rumor or weave about, for example, how the new field manuals are written. Much of them are the top secret. And so I don't know what he's talking about. So when you begin to look at this and you begin kind of get that something is wrong, I mean. And here is the thing that uh, <clears throat> Tony Schaefer, the Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer, spoke to... Uh, um, I don't remember who, oh, Judge Napolitano, that's what he, he uh, spoke to a couple of days ago, and Tony Schaeffer, uh, believe me, as a, many other uh, American uh, um, <clears throat> experts, and uh, they are followed in Russia. And here's their browse, uh, uh, browser translated, summary of Tony Schaeffer, who, or Judge Napolitano yesterday actually, uh, complains that they do not listen to us in the United States, sharply criticize the armed forces of Ukraine, and look what Tony Schaefer says there. We have this, uh, you know, we have, there are effective armored formations designed to penetrate into the enemy defenses. We designed them and they showed themselves well in Iraq. If we had done it, planned uh, the offensive of the armed forces of Ukraine, we would never advise you to do what you are doing now, he said. Well, and here's the problem. Once you hear the uh, Iraq, uh, yeah, Iraq wasn't the real war. And as I already stated many times, as many people from Russian general staff say, it was a joke. And, and it never was any kind of yardstick. It was basically the Turkish shoot under the uh, collection and aggregation and pre-deployment of the required forces for half a year while softening whatever the puny defenses uh, Iraqi had. And when you begin to use this as the yardstick, I'm sorry, guys, your formations, the same as all those rigid, you know, uh, <clears throat> rigid uh, truth, so to speak, or self-evident truth of the armed forces, uh, uh, combined arms operations such as, ooh, fighting the, you know, finding this, you know, weak point between the units, which, you know, usually when you have the line of the contact or the <coughs> point of the contact between two different units, that's where there is the weaker sport. Sport, you have to try to find, to roll your uh, forces in there. Evidently, and that's what Tony Sheffer talks about, but let me show you something. And this is from 1944. No, uh, pardon me, 41. This is uh, one of the <coughs> uh, German Wehrmacht's uh, armored divisions. This is the 38th uh, Regiment going through the what's called defile, they're uh, basically part of the uh, rolling hills, you know, between them, where you can move your armor. And as you can see yourself, this is what it would have been uh, uh, looking if they, you know, the uh, kind of rigid Wehrmacht induced the uh, uh, basically idea of armored warfare against the armed forces which are incapable of defending themselves, looks like in the American view. And this is what Tony Schaefer was trying to promote. Well, guess what? But obviously, we have to constantly keep in mind, you cannot move and aggregate or accumulate force nowadays in the, any kind of the tactical depth. You simply cannot, and you will be seen, and you will be immediately 
you know you will receive a lot of uh, you know uh, fire means <laughs> in your place from be them uh, cruise missiles be them artillery be them uh, uh, aviation and again when you look at this and uh, people invoke Iraq I'm sorry people you had no even air force and air defense there which would contest you here we're talking about the best air defense in the world which is of course Russia and we have right now the best air force in the world and this is just the part of it and we when you look at this uh, tremendous <coughs> set of the senses which Russia is deploying and basically killing in the industrial amounts uh, those uh, armed forces of Ukraine, this is from yesterday. Uh, so we have the aggregate in August 22,255 KIAs. These are KIAs. These are not. Uh, these are not just casualties. These are KIAs, and I already stated in my previous videos that they are. Uh, even Russian TV makes this stresses this point. As you can see yourself, so yeah, good luck trying to do that. And good luck trying to, for example, if you look at the numbers, which are operational coefficients, so to speak, you have to consider that, for example, if uh, even the NATO officers admit that uh, Russian air defense effectiveness is about 80, uh, 92, 98% on all kinds of munitions, including those, you know, HIMARS, what have you, and then it's almost 100% on the <coughs> regular uh, fixed wing aircraft, well, not just fixed, any kind of aircraft, I mean, make your own conclusion okay let's say america uh, u.s army has a better let's say uh, electronic warfare means than uh, let's say ukrainians which by the way they pro pretty much have almost the same thing uh okay reduce their uh, effectiveness of russian air defense to let's say 82 88 <clears> percent <throat> guess what it's still a horrifying number because basically that means you will be shut down no matter what you try to do with a very high probability and it doesn't matter how you tactically try to arrange or juxtapose position your forces be them armor on the ground or be them in uh, in the air i mean you're not gonna get even to the what is being uh touted now is the first line of defense uh, vcu armed forces of ukraine they didn't get to the first line of defense of russian forces and uh now they again as always uh uh, U.S. and Western media, they lie through the T's, and uh, so this Robotina thing, uh, when you look at the it, uh, actually the dynamics of the slaughter day, it's, it's horrifying. It's just absolutely horrifying. And of course, we're looking at now the uh, Pentagon. It's not just Ukraine. It's the Pentagon. They want to uh, basically mobilize whatever is left. And the reason they do that is because they do not know how to prosecute modern war. They do not know how to fight it. The worst thing which could ever happen to the U.S. Army, which already before that had a very unimpressive uh, uh, record, be that Korea, be that, of course, in Vietnam, uh, um, of course, with the exception of this glorious, you know, uh, attack and victory over Grenada, is the fact that they believed their own BS about Iraq and how they defeated it. Well, in reality, as I already stated, it's just, I mean, nobody takes it seriously. And I already stated to you, and you know where it is, uh, I will leave the link uh, in, underneath my video about, uh, basically, Anthony Cordesman and uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies, the original paper from 1994, and it was uh, updated in 2013, where you can read attentively that even there, they admit, and this is one of those rah-rah American rah-rah think tanks, that they admit this is not a real war. It will never repeat itself ever again. So, but hey, th these are the people who continue to go and they just talk about this Iraq as if it matters. It doesn't. It's not real war. It was a Turkish shoot of the first world, uh, basically, enemy, first world army against some I don't know. So in 1990, it, you were fighting something like 1950s uh, armed forces of Iraq. These are the same forces which, with the huge support of the Soviet Union and United States and other countries, couldn't break into the Iran for 10 years, while Iran have been absolutely tortured by the international sanctions and basically everything was cut out 
for Iran. Well, guess what? That tells you something, doesn't it? So, and this is what I was absolutely stunned to learn. And uh, here is the how one of the Russian uh, media channels, uh, it's actually TV channels, talks about when speaking about uh, uh, Tony Schaeffer's uh, presentation, so to speak, uh, about United States uh, critiqued, uh, criticize the counteroffensive of the armed forces of Ukraine. So it tells you everything you need to know. It's, it's a major Russian network, a uh, TV network, TVC, and yeah, it speaks for itself. So, and uh, when you begin to look at this and try to summarize it, it's just like, guys, no matter how you put your tank or armor formations, be them those famous uh, wedges, you know, Wehrmacht wedges. And there have been rhombus. Sometimes you know what rhombus is, half rhombus. <coughs> and they were either with a, uh, a pointy side, you know, directed towards the enemy defenses, or actually 180 degrees, or in Annalena Baerbock's lingo, 368 degrees uh, 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 rotation, they would uh, uh, present broader side uh, when attacking, uh, and uh, th that was done for a simple reason, to stretch the uh, entire uh, tank artillery of the enemy, and then, of course, you know, break through. But no matter what you do, you still need to build yourself into the freaking company and battalion columns to attack and once you begin to do it it's over guys that's that's it you know that you will be noticed not no no it will be detected the targeting will be developed firing solution will be developed and here you go your tanks begin to burn in industrial quantities and that's why for example armed forces of ukraine now suddenly decided to hell with this goddamn nato uh, you know uh, manuals written by really amateurs and they stated that yeah we're gonna go back to the soviet uh, means of defense and uh, wilkerson i mean again listen the guy is evidently out of his league now he talks about that russian sit in the defense and <clears throat> it's the easiest way of conducting the warfare. Uh, Colonel Wilkerson would know if it is easiest or not because obviously the mobile defense Russians conducted with the grossly inferior in size forces in 2022 will be studied for decades in military academies. But you know what? Uh, sour graves, sore losers trying to push this agenda about that. Oh, yeah, we don't understand why they do this and that. You know, uh, just let me remind you in uh, January 1945, uh, first Belarusian front by uh, Georgi Zhukov, instead of going for the Jaguar in Berlin, turns north 90 degrees and moves into Pomerania to uh, basically uh, wipe out the Pomeranian group of Wehrmacht. Once they do that, they turn back and go back to the main axis towards, the, towards Berlin and there you go, you know, the rest of the history. So Russians essentially doing pretty much the same thing for those people who really want to know how you can apply some, some of the lessons of the... <clears throat> of the military history. It's essentially what is happening around Kupiansk and uh, Kharkov. That's probably somewhat uh, reminiscent of that whole situation. And then, of course, after that, you know, we'll, we'll see the, uh, what is going on to the southern group of the uh, armed forces of Ukraine, which are bleeding. I mean, they just bleeding horribly. And uh, for now, I don't think so. Those, those are really... Uh, <clears throat> combat ready troops anymore but it is what it is they throw them you know into this meat grinder and russians are quite content with this and of course if that wasn't enough there was of course the <coughs> six pilots of the 18th brigade near Tomsk of the you know armed forces of ukraine who knows what happened there they have been probably shut down so and i mean it doesn't go well for west not just you know uh Ukraine, from Ukraine is pretty much done. And uh, if that was enough that you can, in conclusion, you can read this, that EU set to import record volume of Russian LNG. So, and when you look at this and uh, suddenly that you have the people speaking in from the West that it is shocking that countries in the EU have worked so hard to win themselves off piped Russian fossil gas only to replace it with the shipped equivalent, said Jonathan Noronta Grant, senior uh, campaigner at Global Witness. Well, I mean, you know what, uh, ask this, uh, what is uh, uh, 
campaigner Jonathan Norona Gant to live without the food for a couple of weeks and see what happens. Uh, let him or he, her, whatever she is, uh, he or she is, uh, win her family or his family from the food, from milk, from meat, so, and see what's going to happen. Well, they will become vegans, right? So, well, <laughs> that's a very serious issue to consider. So, and that's what it is. You do what you have to do to survive. And uh, European Union suddenly recognized that, you know, what no matter how you do, the businesses for them to survive, they need Russian energy one way or another. But it doesn't matter now for Russia because Mr. Putin is on the record that Russia completely reoriented uh, her uh, uh, economic activity towards East and Europe can go to hell, basically. So, and this is what I wanted to tell you today. And uh, I'm so uh, I am surprised myself that I lasted without coughing that much. So, guys, as always, those who like what I do, please subscribe to my channel, and please, those who can afford, please support me on the Patreon and buy me and coffee on two or two. And guys, uh, have a nice <coughs> weekend. I'll talk to you later then.